In this lab, we're going to start looking at sequential logic. And the first lab that we're going to do is to build what we call a 4-bit ripple counter. And this is a counter that can be created exclusively with D flip-flops. So no other logic is needed, just four D flip-flops. Uh, and the way that we wire them together will actually create a binary counter. And then what we're going to do is take a look at another common application of sequential logic storage devices, which is switch debouncing. So we'll take a look at some of the uh, issues that you run into when using a mechanical switch, uh, specifically the, the single pull double throw switch that's in our kit. And we'll take a look at how we can uh, take advantage of an S-bar, R-bar latch uh, to mitigate some of those issues. Okay, so after the doing this lab, you will be able to design a ripple counter using only D flip-flops. You'll be able to explain why mechanical switches produce unclean edges. And then you'll be able to explain how a NAND debounce circuit works, and we'll cover that. And then we're going to set up an oscilloscope for a single shot measurement, which is a powerful measurement to uh, take a look at things that aren't periodic. And then finally, we'll uh, t use the this, this single shot measurements to dis demonstrate the response of a mechanical switch before and after applying an Andy bounce circuit. Okay, so you're going to need your breadboard and wires. We're going to use the analog discovery to power our breadboard and to provide uh, you know, a clock for the first part, and then we're going to use the oscilloscope. We're going to get out a new part in our parts kit, which is going to be a 74HC74D flip-flop. And this is a device that has two separate D flip-flops on it, uh, and we're going to need four of them. So you have two of these devices in your, your kit, two of these ICs. Uh, we're also going to display the output of the 4-bit counter using uh, red LEDs like we have been, but we're just going to build four simple resistor LED circuits. So you're going to need uh, four 150-ohm axial resistors and then four more discrete LEDs. And then you're going to grab a new part, which is your single-pole double-throw push-button switch. And then you're also going to need a NAND gate, a 2 input NAND gate, and two 1K-ohm axial resistors. Okay. There's four deliverables for this. The first part is going to be uh, demonstrating the ripple counter and observing the counter on LEDs and we'll run we'll run the clock at 4 Hertz and then we're going to take a logic analyzer measurement of that we'll crank up the frequency to 1 kilohertz and then we'll look at all four bits of that in the logic analyzer and then we're going to use the oscilloscope to take a look at a switch that produces a clock for us that's not debounced was what we say and then we'll look at it when we do debounce it okay okay so the first thing we want to do is create the 4-bit ripple counter so this is the logic diagram for a ripple counter okay so you take a D flip-flop this is a rising edge D flip-flop and you configure it in what we call a toggle flop configuration that means that in we take the the QN output of it the inverted output and we wire it back to the input D okay so there's no external input to this and what this does is that when we clock it uh, it gets into a toggle toggle situation. So every rising edge of a clock, Q will toggle. So it'll go from a zero, and then the next edge it'll go to a one, then the next rising edge it goes to a zero. And when you do that, the output is actually one half the frequency of the input. <clears throat> okay, so, well, let's think about that. So if the clock was uh, four hertz, this bit would be two hertz. Okay, so it would be it would be slower. But then what we can do, what's cool is we can actually use that output uh, and drive the next toggle flop. And it will be half the frequency. And then we'll drive the next toggle flop and that's half the frequency. And then that than the next one. And so when you have bits that are exactly one half slower than the one before it, it can create something similar to a binary counter. The way that we get all the, the phases correct is we use the QN output to drive the next toggle flop and then that gets all the, the phases correct and you actually come up with a perfect binary counter. So it's a very simple, uh, simple circuit uh, that we will make. Okay, so here's what you're gonna breadboard here and what you're going to do is have these two parts here. Now I want to point out a couple things. So if you look at the D flip-flops here, uh, each one is separate. Okay, so it's going to have a separate D, separate clock, separate Q, QN. But each D flip-flop also has a preset and a reset, and they're both active low. So we want to enable the D flip-flops. In this lab, we're just going to uh, 
de-assert both of those lines, we need to tie the preset and, and reset uh, to VCC. And that way, it'll be pulled to a logic 1, and it won't be asserted. So you need to do that, though, for every D-flip-flop. So for example, this side of this 74, HC74, is a D-flip-flop. And it noticed that I had to, to connect its preset and, and reset to VCC. Well, I also had to do that for the D-flip-flop on the right side of the part. And then I had to do it down here for this part. And then I had to do it for that part. This is a very common mistake that people make is they forget to deassert those lines. And it takes, you know, for this circuit, it takes four wires, four dedicated wires per device or per IC. So you're going to need eight wires just to enable this device. Okay, and so then what you're going to do is, you can see these wires, you'll feed the QN back to the D input of all four, and I did that with the purple wire right here. And then what you do is we're going to bring in the initial clock uh, from the arbitrary waveform ge generator on the analog discovery, so that's going to be W1 or channel 1, and that feeds the first D flip-flop clock. And then the QN output of it is going to feed the second D flip-flop, which I positioned over here, and then that is going to the QN output of that will come down here, feed the clock of this D flip flop, and then that one will feed the the D flip flop or the clock input of this D flip flop. And then what I did is, okay, so the four bit counter is running. Then what you need to do is take the Q outputs, and I did that with these four red wires, and I bring them over to a resistor LED circuit. So I just put four of these 150 ohm axial resistors, and then I took four LEDs and I put the anode here connected to the resistor and then I put the cathode into ground. <clears throat> and so when you do this, if you turn on the clock, this will just count and you're off and running. You also need power to your board. So you're going to go ahead and bring over power and ground from the analog discovery. And then you're going to want to measure the uh, measure the counter in a subsequent step using the logic analyzer. So while I was wiring these up, I went ahead and just connected the logic analyzer right here. And I put pin headers. So all these analog discovery leads are going into pin headers. OK, so that's it. Uh, let's take a look at my breadboard here. You can see I have everything set up just like the picture, because the picture was this. Uh, and here's my LEDs and all that. And let's go ahead and get this running. So I want to pull up, uh, I've completed the, wave, the breadboarding. And now what I want to do is turn on the analog discovery. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn on the supplies. Uh, a little hint here on the power supplies. What I always do is turn off the one I'm not using and then I come over here and I put 3.4 but I need to hit return to get it to enter or to actually accept it so I hit return. Now when I come over here and I hit play on this uh, if you look at the breadboard, you might see some of these red LEDs on uh, for the counter, and who knows what the values are. But one of the ways I always check to make sure the breadboard is on is, is if I have power to the breadboard, my LED driver circuit will be on, and so I can always come over here and turn these on, and that, that just verifies that I have power to the board. Okay, so now what I want to do is let's get the arbitrary waveform generator going. So I'm going to go back to welcome, and I'll go wave gen and it pops up here by default as a sine wave and let's go ahead we want to create a square wave and let's start off with four hertz because that's fast enough it'll go through all the counters but slow enough we can see it with our eyes and then of course we want this uh, signal that swings between 0 and 3.4 volts so we'll put the amplitude at 1.7 and the offset at 1.7 so that gets me a perfect signal okay so now I'm gonna go ahead and run the arbitrary waveform generator and let's take a look at our system and here we go so it's binary counting. And this is a 4-bit counter. So this is larger than anything we've done in the past. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, and it counts all the way up to 15 and rolls over. So that is the first deliverable for this exercise. So take a for your records, take a short video of that thing running and that it's deliverable number one. The next thing we want to do is take a logic analyzer measurement of the 4-bit ripple counter. And this is to start looking at larger and larger buses. So here's what we're going to do. We already have the logic analyzer connected uh, from our breadboard step. So let's go ahead and first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come into wave gen. And I, since I want to more data on the screen. Uh, I want a lot of data on the screen, so if I let it run really slow, it's going to take forever to fill up, and I'm gonna, it's going to take a long time for me to see transitions. So let's go ahead and pop this up to 1K. So I go ahead and put 1 kilohertz, and at this point, you'll notice that the LEDs on the counter are just all kind of half on, half off, and that's because they're just moving too fast. You can't see them. Uh, okay, so now let's go to welcome, and let's bring up the logic analyzer tool. And what I want to do now is I would like to create a new 4-bit bus. So all I do is I simply hit 
click to add channels and I'm gonna add a bus and let's call it uh, ripple count abbreviated CNT and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add 0 1 2 and 3 of my channels because that's what I wired and I'll go ahead and say add alright so at this point I should be able to just simply hit run and see data on the screen okay so I'm gonna let it run and I'm not gonna trigger it I'm just gonna run it for a bit and then stop and now let me zoom in so I can get more transitions on the screen and let me run it again and fill it up and there you go so check this out this is uh, I have the counter is running 0 1 2 3 4 up to 15 and it rolls over and by default this will show in a binary or excuse me a decimal count which is great because that shows me that the logic analyzer is able to interpret those four bits as a actual decimal number so that shows me this is I can observe that and then down here you see the individual bits and this is where you can really see how the the ripple counter works and so the LSB is running here it's actually running at uh, 500 Hertz because it's half of the clock frequency but then we clock the next toggle flop or the next bit of the ripple counter and it's at half the frequency and then that's used to clock this and it's at half the frequency and then this is half the frequency and that's what a ripple counter is that's what a binary counter is but this this particular one uh, shows it in in graphical detail now you would notice that if you've ran this too fast there would be delay through this and these numbers would start becoming corrupted because the transitions wouldn't line up but we're running slow enough we're not going to have that issue so what you should do now is go ahead and take a screenshot of this and save it as a jpeg for your records and that will be deliverable number two okay now we move on to looking at mechanical switches so if you take a look at this switch right here uh, <clears throat> this is a mechanical switch and what happens it's a single pull double throw so when I press it it just connects the contact between two other contacts and this circuit right here is showing a graphical depiction of it uh, just in terms of connections if you look at the connection I drew this picture uh, kind of to represent how the leads go if you look at the leads on here you'll notice that two are closer together than the other one and that's what I show in this picture right here so the outer one is is this guy right here which is this outer one and then the one that's closer to it is the middle one and then this is the one over here and the way you, you do it is you put it into your breadboard like this and if you stuff it all the way over as close as you can to the gap you have one row right here or one column of contacts that you can gain access to so what we want to do for this par for this uh, part is wire the outer contact to ground which you see right there and then the inner contact of ECC and then the output is going to be our clock and what happens is that clock is going to be sitting at zero and when I press the button it's going to go to one and that should be a clock and I let go of it and it goes back to zero and so I should be able to sit here and tap on this button and create a clock here's the problem with it uh, this exhibits two behaviors that are that are characteristic of mechanical switches one is in this double single du single pole double throw switch you have a break before make uh, situation so the way to think about it is when you're connecting the clock to a VCC that's great it's at a one or excuse me to ground it's a one but when you push the button there's a moment in time where that contact is not it's in between it's moving between ground and VCC so the clock is at some unknown level so you essentially have a signal which you don't know what its value is that's really bad when you have it on the clock line because the clock is what triggers the D flip flops to do their thing so what's gonna happen during this break before make or when it's floating <clears throat> you're not gonna know what the value of clock is and in fact it'll get pulled to some random level uh, and we wanna kind of observe that uh, the next thing that's interesting is that when a switch contact it's a mechanical switch when it comes down here and hits this final destination contact it actually bounces so it'll come down here and it'll hit this go to VCC then it'll bounce up and down for a little bit of time like, like a cantilever that you fling and it'll go between VCC and open VCC open VCC open so there's two behaviors that you see here one is when it's open for the first time clock is pulled to some random value then it goes to its final value and it bounces so we talk about this being the break before make and the bounce associated with the switch so here's what you want to do let's go ahead and disconnect the arbitrary waveform generator so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it I'm gonna stop the arbitrary waveform generator so wave gen and I'm gonna stop that and what I want to do is I want to disconnect it and then I'm gonna bring in my mechanical switch and I'm gonna 
use that to clock it. Okay, so now here we go. Here is here is the switch, and I'm going to hit the button. And notice that it's starting to count. Okay, but if you hit it long enough, and new switches aren't as bad as, as ones that are, have been used, every once in a while it'll jump over a count value. And so this is exhibiting that it has some strange behavior. Now it's hard to see graphically other than a count that actually jumps you know, over a value. Uh, and this is a brand new switch, so this is actually doesn't have, isn't that big, big of a deal. You don't see it as much. But I, I can hit the button and sometimes it won't even count. Uh, but, and then sometimes it jumps over a count. Uh, so what we want to do is let's observe it with the oscilloscope. So go ahead and at this moment in time, let's take channel one of the oscilloscope and I'm going to wire it up to this input so that I can see what's going on. And remember with the oscilloscope on the analog discovery, I'm going to use one plus to observe the clock of coming from the switch. And then I'll, I have the, the reference for channel one. I need to put that into ground. So I'm going to put that into the ground rail. And now I'm going to uh, fire up the tool, the oscilloscope tool. So I come back into waveforms and I want to go to scope and I want to take a measurement on the switch. Okay. Now the switch is generating a rising edge and I only care about that rising edge. I don't, you know, and, it, and it's very slow relative to how fast an oscilloscope can go. So what I want to do is I want to set up something called a single shot measurement. All right. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to position uh, the waveform vertically on the screen. Okay, so I want to come in here and let me let me do this here. So I want to I want to do the settings so that I can actually see it. So the first thing I want to do is come over here to channel one. I'm gonna turn channel two off and let's go ahead and do the offset as negative 1.5 volts and then for the divisions leave it at 0.5 volts per division and you'll notice over here that now I can see from 0 volts this is ground up to 3.5 and that's where my signal is going to be switching so now it's positioned vertically on the screen so that's great horizontally though I want to uh, have the trigger position right at 0 so I want to have this position at 0 but I want to zoom way in okay so I want to zoom in to <clears throat> let's go all the way to like 0.5 microseconds per division. So now I'm zoomed way, way in on that transition. But I want to, if I run this right now, I don't know what I see. It's So basically, it's tr it's just kind of sitting there looking at the zero. I don't want that. What I want is I want it to run one measurement and then stop so I can see what's happening. So I want to set up the trigger to be single shot. And what I mean by that is I want to set up trigger to be normal, meaning that it'll just trigger once and stop. It's not going to try to automatically trigger over and over. I want to trigger off channel 1, which is where the clock is coming in from the switch. I want it on rising and then I want to look at right when it's in between the 0 to 1. So I want to put it at 1.7. Okay? okay, so I'm sitting here and I've got all my settings and now what I do is I just hit single and what it does is it gets ready to take the measurement. It says it's armed and that means that it's waiting for the trigger to happen. So now when I come over here and I push the button, it will trigger. So now what it what it does when it triggers is it triggers one time and it fills the screen up. And so now if you look at this, look at what I have here. I have an edge and I have a bunch of ringing up here. So this is the bouncing. So this is where it comes up here and then it bounces a little bit. And every every one of these is going to be different because it depends on how your finger presses the switch. And so we want to run this a bunch of different times in order to actually see the behavior. So what I'm going to do is to run it again, I'm going to go single and then I press the button. Single, press the button. There. So look at this one. Notice right down here that this lower part jumped up a little bit. That's the break before make behavior. So in, in this situation, this represented that the contact was floating and then the bounce wasn't as bad this time. And I'm just going to do this a bunch of times. So I'm going to single press the button. Look at this one. This one was really obvious that it was bouncing like crazy. The break before make wasn't too bad. And I'll single press the button. That one was really good. Single press the button. 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 And you, so you just do this over and over until you get a nice waveform. This is a really good one that's, that's obvious. This one you can see the break before make and this one bounces a little bit. But what I want you to do is go ahead and get a measurement that shows both. Like this would be a, a good one right here. And just do it over and over until you get a good screenshot and then take a screenshot and save it as a JPEG for your record. And that, that represents uh, looking at the behavior of the mechanical switches. So single, boom, 
one single bump. Some of them are really nice. Some of them are horrible. That one, you could see it, the break before make. And you can single, so armed, single, arm, single. Okay, so you're going to get a bunch of different ones. But anyway, all right. How do you fix this? Well, the way that you fix it is you can use what we call a NAND debounce circuit. And this is an annotated version of of what we just did. So that was this that screenshot was deliverable number three. This circuit right here is a circuit that was invented to get rid of these issues in single pole double throw switches. And what you do here is this is an S bar R bar latch and you use that with these pull up resistors and what the pull up resistors do is that when the switch is not driving these it will pull them up to ones. Okay? And the reason that's important is because these resistors are big enough that the switch can override them. When it is connected to ground, it is going to be pulling it to zero. No way. It's These are only strong enough to pull up to a one when you're not connecting it to ground. Okay. So this, what it does when you pull these up to ones is when you have ones on these inputs, it puts the S bar R bar latch into a store state. So if you think about it, right here, when you didn't press this, you're driving a zero into here, and so you have a zero on this NAND gate, and you have a one over here. And you say, why'd you have a one? Well, it's because if you follow this path, notice that this contact is not connected to anything. That means this pull-up resistor is pulling it. So you have a, a zero here and a one there. That will create a zero over here. So you've essentially put this in the uh, in the set state, which would if the output was here, but this was the clear one. So we tie the, the clock onto this bottom NAND. Then what happens is when this contact gets in the middle, it's floating, this goes into the store state. So now nobody's driving these lines from the switch, but these pull-up resistors are able to pull the NAND gate inputs to a 1. And when this S bar R bar latch gets 1 and 1, it has the store. So that means this will stay at a 0. So it's not going to jump up into the middle like we saw on that scope screen. It actually will stay at a 0. The great thing about this is that once this hits over here and it pulls this line down here to a zero, okay, you put that into what we call the clear state for this guy, which is a one up here, or excuse me, a zero up here and a one down here for the clock. That has caused the clock to transition from a zero to a one. And now we're at a one. And it's like, okay, so I, ha I got rid of that break before make behavior. The problem then becomes I have bounce. So imagine that this contact is down here and it's bouncing bouncing between ground and open, ground and open, ground and open. Well, that's okay too because when it goes, this clock is at a one, and when it goes back into the open state, these pull-up resistors take over and they drive ones into these NAND gates, and that stores it. So now you're going to store again, but you're going to store the new value. So what happens is that if you look at the new edge, in this situation right here, you, you're at a zero. You might have gone into a break behavior where the contact is floating, but the S bar R bar latch holds it at a zero. Then it transitions and it holds it, and then all of a sudden you go up to here, and now it hits a one, but then when it bounces between a one and an open and one and open, it's going to store its last value, which in this situation is a one. So what I want you to do is build the circuit. Okay, so you're just going to put a NAND gate down, you're going to put these resistors here, and you're going to wire it up. And now I want you to drive your ripple counter with the new switch and take a measurement of it. And you'll see that the break before make now vanishes, and the bounce up here almost vanishes. And in fact, this probably isn't even bounce. It's probably just a little bit of ringing just due to the way that signals transition. And I want you to take a screenshot of this, the new uh, clean edge, and then that will represent that you have s observed the impact of debouncing a switch. So take an image of that, and that's deliverable for. Okay, so after completing this, can you design a ripple counter using discrete D flip-flops? Can you explain mechanical switches, why they produce unclean edges? You know, can you explain what I just said to somebody about the break before make in a single pull double throw? Or, and can you explain what bounce is, the whole cantilever effect? Okay, and then can you explain how a Nandy bounce circuit works? This this one takes a little bit of thinking about because it it's an S bar R bar latch, and you just have to think about putting it into the store state using these pull up resistors and why it stores a zero in the initial state and then why it stores a one in the second state. So you think about that. And then can you set up an oscilloscope for a single shot measurement? 
this is different from just starting the oscilloscope and hitting run. It's you have to think about what the trigger does and what it, it, it means to trigger and fill up the screen and then stop. And then could you demonstrate the response of a me mechanical switch before and after applying a NAND bounce circuit? To do that, you have to think about could I take a measurement on a bad clock circuit and a good clock circuit based upon a single pole double throw switch. Okay, if you can do that, you are done.